Okay, time for part 4. But I gotta apologize for a few things first. Like always. What are you doing here? Anyway, last time I said the speed of light was 299,792 kilometers per hour, but I meant kilometers per second. Either way, I still got the idea across, right? And second, there's an audio mistake at the very end of the last video. But believe it or not, you will survive. It's not deadly. Now we can get to the sweet stuff. So you, as usual, try to come up with at least one way to surpass the speed of light. You say, Well, you said we could have any configuration of motions, and they still wouldn't pass the speed of light. That's right. By the way, your voice is higher pitched now, so you can tell us apart. But what if one object is orbiting another at 80% the speed of light, and then we grab the whole system and move it in one direction at another 80% the speed of light? First of all, to make communication easier, let's say the object in the middle is tennis ball, and the orbiting object is golf ball. Sounds good. So when golf ball is on the leading side of the orbit, she'll be going 80 plus 80 equals 160% the speed of light. You said velocities don't add up simply like that. And you get something crazy like 97.6% the speed of light. And then, when golf ball is on the receding side of the orbit, the two motions cancel out and we get 0% speed, right? Um, I think so. But that weird addition just doesn't sit right with me. Because from tennis ball's perspective, he's not moving at all and golf ball's orbiting. And since we just took the whole system and moved it uniformly in one direction, golf ball should still orbit at a constant speed and in a perfect circle. Yet, it looks like the speed up on this side was only 17.6%, but the slowdown was 80%. So how can they still be equal? Yeah, this situation is pretty confusing at first. Those speed ups and slowdowns definitely don't seem equal. But perhaps they are equal, because remember, the object's clocks are also changing. Well, what do you mean? Well, if golf ball's clock slows down relative to us when she's on the leading side of the orbit, then a speed up of 17% from our perspective will appear to happen a lot faster for her. So much faster that it might just compensate and make both sides of the orbit equal again. Uh, what? You know what, why don't we just show what the simulation does? The simulator can only deal with one dimension of space, so let's say that golf ball's orbit is just doing a perfect sine wave up and down around tennis ball, and then the whole tennis ball golf ball system will accelerate upwards. I think the best place to start is with tennis ball's point of view. Remember, halfway through, tennis ball is going to accelerate upwards, and because you said we're just gonna move the whole tennis ball golf ball system upwards, that just means that from tennis ball's point of view, golf ball's motion will stay regular, meaning same speed and same shape of orbit. But golf ball's orbit definitely doesn't stay the same speed and shape. Look at that madness. She definitely slows down and goes all warpy. Wait until tennis ball gets there, okay? Tennis ball's change of velocity will cause space time to shift a bit, and look at that. Golf ball's orbit is actually staying intact. From tennis ball's perspective here, golf ball's behavior is the same now as it was before the acceleration. So as you requested, nothing really changed. Oh, I get it. I guess, even from the beginning, you could tell golf ball's slower orbit later on would appear faster to tennis ball anyway, because tennis ball's birthdays are further apart here, meaning his clock is running slower. Exactly. Also, look at the second half of this graph. If you look from Snowball's point of view, Golf Ball spends like 90% of her time traveling away from him, makes sense, right? But only 10% of her time traveling towards him. But if you take on Tennis Ball's point of view, Golf Ball is spending 50% going towards and 50% going away. Isn't that strange? Yeah, but what about Golf Ball herself? What proportion of time does she think she's spending going towards Snowball? Well, I can show you. But let me warn you, it's a bit nauseating. Ugh, you think GB's perspective of life is nauseating? That's golf ball phobic and offensive! Go away! But yeah, here we go! Notice when golf ball is at her maximum speed relative to tennis ball, she's getting closer to the speed of light. So, as expected, the size of the universe shrinks a bit. Also, snowball and tennis ball's ages are jumping all over the place. Okay, that's it for a golf ball and tennis ball story. In short, golf ball is able to stay under the speed of light by drastically stretching the portions of time where her speeds add up a lot, thus diluting the effect, and shrinking the portions of time where her speeds cancel out. Next, I want to ask you, have you ever heard that the faster an object moves, the shorter it gets? I have heard that, but you have to be going at relativistic speeds to see a noticeable effect. 
That's true. But do you know why? Um, no. Well, neither do I. But I have a guess, which brings us to our fifth batch of characters. Here we have Pen, Blocky, and Eraser. Blocky and Eraser like each other, but also kinda hate each other. They're frenemies. So they want to stay exactly one light year apart, close enough to stay friends, but far enough to not get on each other's nerves. But whose frame of reference is this one light year measured under? Good question. We'll be going by Blocky or Eraser's frame of reference. It actually doesn't matter which one we choose. So you can see, Blocky, as the more commanding one, decides to go north at close to the speed of light, and Eraser, as the more submissive one, must figure out exactly where to be, so he's exactly one light year north of Blocky. I can do that. Why don't we just shift Blocky's path up one light year to create Eraser's path? That would work if we were going by Penn's frame of reference, which doesn't change. But Eraser and Blocky's frame of reference does change. So we gotta try a little harder. Here's how I like to think about it. Every time Blocky accelerates an infinitesimally small amount, Eraser must accelerate the same infinitesimally small amount at the same time. The key here is that that time is Blocky's time. The first increment is simple. Blocky starts going up, and Eraser does that at exactly the same time. For this visual, let's not change our frame of reference. We'll stick with the stable pen. The second increment is a bit more confusing. So normally, a vertical line shows events happening at the same time, but under the Lorentz transformation, when Blocky starts moving this way, his line of same time moves this way. That's because it's all based on the one-to-one -one diagonal, and it's symmetrical blah blah blah. So for Eraser's second acceleration to be at exactly the same time as Blocky's, he's gotta start accelerating here, which appears slightly later for us. The third acceleration is just like the second, but even more extreme. Blocky's line of same time tilts even more, so Eraser waits even longer before accelerating as well. And that just continues until Blocky reaches his maximum speed. By the end of it, Eraser seems to have lagged a fair bit behind Blocky, making their distance appear shorter to Pen. Indeed, if we made Blocky and Eraser hold a solid metal rod between the two of them, as they did their trip. When the bar starts to move faster and faster, it will appear to get shorter and shorter. But notice how I called the bar a solid metal bar. That's because the bar actually isn't flexible and squishing, it's actually rigid. How so? Well, from either Blocky or Eraser's perspective, remember that the other person is always exactly one light year away. That's how we created this whole scenario in the first place. So, if the bar is rock solid, and exactly a light year long, that's A-OK, -okay because its endpoints actually do stay the same distance apart, from their perspective. Also, notice that the two ends of the bar are nearly a year different in age. So yeah, Penn sees this bar squish really short, but the material of the bar itself isn't really going under compression. And, if I'm not mistaken, that is the reason why fast-moving objects get shorter. Cool, right? Yeah! By the way, I'm not gonna need you anymore, so bye. Wait, not yet! Okay, now let's derive some equations. One equation is this, which means that given some velocity v you're going at, your time will pass t prime seconds while everyone else's time passes t seconds. So, your time gets t prime over t slower, which is slower the bigger v is. How could we have figured that out on our own? Those of you who know about the double mirror that uses the bouncing photon as a clock, please don't mention the double mirror that uses a bouncing photon as a clock. I'm not going to use it because I want to see what conclusions I can get to by solely using my relativity simulator. Second, there's this thing called a Minkowski diagram, which my visualizer might actually be very similar to, so oops. I guess that's what I get for not doing any research beforehand. Rest in peace me. Also, I recorded this after everything else, so you're gonna hear me say some of this again later. How could we have figured that out on our own? Well, let's graph some arbitrary object going at some arbitrary velocity v, like this. To make things easier, let's put the origin on the path as well. What's the slope of this line? Well, if the object is going at light speed, c, then the slope of the line is 1. If the object's not moving, then the slope is 0. So, you can see that the slope is just how fast you're going relative to the speed of light. In other words, the slope is v over c. Slope is rise over run. So at the x-coordinate of 1, 
The y coordinate must be the slope, v over c. Simple enough, therefore, our point is 1, v over c. Now, how do we calculate time dilation? Well, we start with our graph, and then take on the object's frame of reference, i.e., make its path horizontal. The time distance, aka x distance, between these two points is 1. For clarity, let's call those points O and A. And anything after the transformation, we'll just add a prime to the end of it, so we have O prime and A prime. Whatever the x distance after the transformation is, will tell us how much the time dilated. So, we just need to find the difference between the x coordinates of O prime and A prime after the transformation. Under any linear transformation, the origin won't move, so we know it'll still be 0, 0. Therefore, all we have to find out is where A prime goes. Diagonal scaling is really confusing, especially when we're dealing with horizontal and vertical lines like this. However, we know that diagonal lines stay diagonal through any diagonal scaling, so maybe they'll be easier to work with. If we draw out diagonal lines from O and A, we get a rectangle. All these blue lines are 1 to 1 diagonal, so this triangle has angles 45, 45, 90. So, it's a right isosceles triangle. For each right isosceles triangle, the legs are the same length, which means that since this length is V over C, this is also V over C. This length is 1, so this length is 1 minus V over C. Here's another right isosceles triangle. The hypotenuse of any right isosceles triangle is root 2 longer than a leg. So this length is 1 minus V over C over root 2. So is this. And since we have another right isosceles triangle here, and this is V over C, this here is root 2 V over C. Now we know the dimensions of our diagonal rectangle. 1 minus V over C over root 2, and these two numbers added together, which is 1 plus V over C over root 2. How does that help us? Well, 1 to 1 diagonal lines will stay 1 to 1 diagonal lines after our diagonal scaling transformation. So, this diagonal rectangle will still have diagonal lines and thus be another diagonal rectangle afterward. Linear transformations keep the overall structure of everything the same. So, since the original rectangle had O and A as opposite corners, rectangle prime also has O prime and A prime as opposite corners. Furthermore, we know where O prime lies, 0, 0. And we actually know something about A prime too. Since we gotta make the object's trajectory horizontal to take on its frame of reference, A prime, which is on the object's trajectory, must be on that horizontal line and have a y coordinate of 0. That tells us something huge. If there's some diagonal rectangle that has O prime and A prime as opposite corners, and O prime and A prime have the same y coordinate, then that means our new diagonal rectangle is a square. Think about it, that's the only way it'll fit. Remember, one of the rules of the transformation is that the area must stay constant. So the areas of rectangle and rectangle prime are the same. What's the area of this rectangle? Easy! We have its dimensions, so just multiply. 1 minus v squared over c squared over 2. That must also be the area of rectangle prime as well. And guess what? It's a square, so we can just take the square root and get side length. Glorp. Now, we want to find the diagonal length of our square. Again, we find another right isosceles triangle, so we can just multiply this big mess by square root 2, and we get the square root of 1 minus v squared over c squared. That is the horizontal distance, aka time difference, between O prime and A prime. Therefore, the transformation took a time of 1 year, and squished it to the square root of 1 minus v squared over c squared years. The whole transformation is linear, which means that for any time t, the end result will be t times the square root of 1 minus v squared over c squared. Bam! Equation derived. Using this equation, you can figure out that if your environment thinks 1 second past, then if you're traveling 10% the speed of light, only 0.9950 seconds have passed for you. At 50% the speed of light, your clock will have only ticked forward 0.866 seconds, and at 99% the speed of light, you will have experienced only a mere 0.141 seconds. Some of you might be thinking that it would have been easier to derive this equation with that moving double mirror clock thing. With that method, 
you can just use the Pythagorean theorem and you're done. But in this video series, I'm just trying to test out what my special relativity visualizer can do. So I'm just showing you that the same equation can also be derived in this other, albeit more complex, way. I've also used this visualizer to derive two other equations, adding velocities and length contraction. However, this video is already 14 minutes long, so that might have to wait for another video. Well, I think that's about it for my attempt at explaining special relativity. Again, I am absolutely not an expert in this subject, and I could be entirely wrong. But I just wanted to get my ideas out there, and I hope you enjoyed it. There are a bunch of other cool things I could also do with my simulator, but this video can't go on forever. So that's it. Bye!